It cannot come soon enough. A vaccine that can safely protect us from the novel coronavirus and COVID-19. When will it become available for widespread use and how will it be distributed? Local health care experts provide an update on the status of COVID-19 vaccine and treatment research coming up now on Living in the New Normal, Race for a Vaccine. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh, and thanks for joining us for this installment of Living in the New Normal. In this half hour, we will learn more about COVID-19 vaccine research and timeline, and also about treatments for the disease. And joining us to talk about this are Dr. Fred Lopez, professor and infectious disease specialist, LSU Health New Orleans School of Medicine. Dr. Lucio Mila, professor and assistant dean for Transla translational research at LSU Health New Orleans School of Medicine, and also head of the Department of Genetics and Precision Medicine program there. Dr. Mark Roberts, dean of research at Oxner Health, and Dr. Frank Welch, medical director for the Center for Community Preparedness and the Louisiana Immunization Program for the Louisiana Department of Health. All right, really important topic that we're going to cover right now, vaccine and then also treatments for the novel coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, Dr. Roberts, I'm going to go over to you first, because uh, it, it, vaccine, everyone wants to know, when are we going to get this vaccine? Well, here in New Orleans at Oxner, you guys have been conducting a trial on the vaccine. Um, so first, I would like for you to sort of explain to us, there are different types of vaccines. Um, what are you guys working with? What could, what is out there? What kind of vaccines are there? Our participants in two different kinds of trials. The first, Pfizer is using a unique piece of the virus itself called mRNA which ends up coding part of the virus, this protein, one that our immune system is to react to. A second trial with Janssen is using a, vir a different virus, adenovirus, to deliver a piece of the COVID uh, uh, virus for the immune system to react to. So there is um, a, a number of different molecular techniques that have worked very rapidly to help develop vaccines at this point. And so let's talk now a little bit, focus more at, at home, because here in New Orleans, um, there is this trial, as I said, going on, and Oxner is conducting that. Um, how is it looking right now? How long has that been going on? At what phase are you right now? At what point? Sure. The first of the trials, the first activated worldwide is a Pfizer study, and there will be tens of thousands of subjects in, enrolled internationally. Our site has enrolled 230 subjects, and the last of which received the second uh, dose of either vaccine or placebo as a booster yesterday. We will be beginning an even larger study with Janssen that will involve a thousand of subjects from around Lafayette, Baton Rouge, West Bank, and the Kenner area. Um, this will begin probably next week and continue over eight weeks. So we um, will be contributing in a large way to uh, learning about the early impacts of the, of the vaccine, whether it is uh, causing patients to develop antibody and uh, longer follow-up of these patients to see if it truly protects against recurrent or occurrence of infection. Um, as far as the, the trials of, that are being conducted, what it goes into the decision-making about where these trials will be conducted? Yeah, both uh, these sponsors and others that are developing vaccines are looking to sites that can do the work of enrolling patients extremely well, efficiently, large numbers of patients, and especially in representing a diversity of the population, mm -hmm. those that uh, are most at risk for having serious complications. So we've uh, done a good job of, of representing what New Orleans looks like in our initial study with Pfizer, and the same will be true with Janssen. We're trying very hard to attract um, all comers, including African Americans, Latino, Asians, and um, all all of those who are at risk for this virus, and those especially that uh, may have more serious complications. Um, we're, we're trying to attract to the study. We're doing this across a broad geography as well to be as inclusive as possible. When we do have the vaccine um, or vaccines, what do we expect? these vaccines to do for us, Dr. Roberts? Well, ideally, they'll uh, confer immunity so that very few 
patients that receive an active vaccine will uh, end up with a COVID infection. We don't know what the success rate will be. The first indication of these studies will be the development of antibody, the same thing that we're testing to understand prevalence of this infection mm -hmm. in our populations. But whether that antibody lasts for a long time, is protective for several months or a year or longer, or whether um, the virus will change and additional immunizations in the future will be needed is simply not known. Uh, we don't know if this will be more like the flu virus that requires annual vaccines mm -hmm. or whether a different kind of virus with some stability where one vaccine may protect you for a longer period of time. Um, we will not know the results of these two uh, vaccination studies formally for about two years. So we're gonna have to make decisions to protect our population with limited information around antibodies and getting uh, the vaccines that look the most promising um, into uh, our populations as soon as uh, that seems feasible and they're available. Okay, that, that was something I wanted to get into also, is is the speed of this. Dr. Welch, I'm going to bring you in here. You know, uh, the vaccine, to, to, for the vaccine to really be an effective vaccine or vaccines, how many we have out there, people need to be vaccinated. Um, they need to feel safe. They need to trust it. Um, the government has an operation called Operation Warp Speed to really work quickly to get a vaccine developed. It usually takes a whole lot longer. So, I mean, what, how can the people out there, how can the population feel safe and trust whatever vaccine is going to be made available so that they will get inoculated. Dr. Welch? Absolutely. So every vaccine, just like every medicine, goes through some pretty strict trials in order to even become available to the public. Um, none of those steps are being skipped with any of these trials. There will be phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. The, the step that was skipped was they usually do these in sequence and uh, uh, this particular vaccine actually during phase three trials, some companies are already beginning production during that period. So really none of the safety steps have been skipped. But in addition to that though, the Food and Drug Administration will independently review all information from all clinical trials as well as several independent bodies. So we will actually have quite a bit of information about the safety, the efficacy, of each of these vaccines before it is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Now, you know, in, immediately there there's going to be limited dosage, and I understand that in, with some of the vaccines there have been quite a, uh, maybe millions of doses actually produced. If it doesn't work, then they just have to get rid of those. Um, so that's going to take some time just to ramp up uh, uh, the number of doses available. Then distribution is really a big issue. How in the state of Louisiana are we going to handle that? So we've actually been planning for quite some time. Unlike the, the testing and the, and the original disease that was sort of surprised on the, on the medical uh, community of the United States and the world, we've actually had time to plan for vaccine receipt, distribution, administration. Um, we've been working very uh, extensively for about four and a half months. And remember, we've already had a trial run of this as well during H1N1 in 2009. So the state of Louisiana has been uh, preparing quite extensively for this. We will follow the guidance for the federal initial allocation of those original doses. I think it was mentioned a little earlier. We do want to first protect those that we do think are coming into corona, uh, contact with coronavirus. Those are the frontline healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the next step would be those people most at risk for serious complications. Then we're going to take a broader step out further and further as we get more and more vaccine until vaccine becomes available to the general public. Okay, so there is a, a plan in place is what you're saying. Um, uh, Absolutely. And, and, and I'm, I, I do want to find out from all of you guys, and we'll get to that a little bit closer to the end, where when do you think we're going to be at the point where people will be getting the vaccine? And we will get to that point. But first, one other thing that people are interested in, it's antibodies. We have been hearing about at this point in time, certainly in the, the early part of October, a lot about antibody treatment, monoclonal or polyclonal treatment. Certainly our president actually had an experimental dose of, uh, of uh, polyclonal treatment. What is that? What, what are the antibodies? Dr. Mila, um, I'm going to have you explain that. So monoclonal antibodies that are used today for, for therapeutic purposes are genetically engineered molecules. They are artificial. They are the 
the, the genes that uh, drive the production of antibodies, for each antibody there are two genes, a so-called heavy chain and a light chain, can be engineered. Uh, the way the antibodies that are being tested right now are developed uh, consists of taking antibody-producing cells from patients who have developed so-called neutralizing antibodies, means, meaning antibodies that can stop the entrance of the virus into mm. cells. Then you copy the antibody genes from these cells. You move these genes into a, an artificial cell line. You then produce the antibodies in large amounts from this cell line, purify them, and turn them into a medicine. So uh, that's a process that I uh, was involved in regulating when I was at the Food and Drug Administration mm -hmm. many years ago. And there is a study uh, going on now through LSU Health uh, about this, is there not? That's correct. Uh, we do have a trial of one of the monoclonal antibody treatments uh, that are currently uh, under investigation for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and so, with the antibody uh, antibody treatment, is will that, as we have seen, particularly like with what happened with President Trump and him getting that dose, was to help him uh, not get worse with uh, COVID nineteen? Is that what the antibodies are, are there for, or will they act as sort of a short term preventative? So that will depend on the antibody and the results of the clinical trials. Uh, the particular product that the president received is actually a mixture of two monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the reason why two is a good idea is because during the development of these antibodies, the sponsor that produced them uh, grew viruses in test tubes in the presence of a single antibody and saw that very quickly resistant mutants were accumulating. So you need more than one in order to prevent a quick escape of the virus through mutation. Uh, right now, that particular cocktail uh, has been tested in 275 patients with mild disease uh, at two different doses. Uh, and what it has done is shorten the duration of the symptomatic period. We don't know yet whether it'll be effective in severe disease. Uh, it could potentially be used as a preventative mm -hmm. agent, uh, for example, in somebody who has been exposed, uh, it, would be, it would be injected intravenously and hopefully reduce the amount of virus circulating uh, in that patient. But, but, you know, once again, this is all in, uh, in trials right now. You're still studying it, researching it, testing it. So um, do you think that feeling better about this kind of treatment, understanding more exactly how it will work, will come before we settle on a vaccine? Uh, that's possible. Uh Everything is uncertain. Uh, things are moving very fast, but again, as we heard before, no safety steps are being skipped. Uh, usually the development of a monoclonal antibody product goes through those same stages, phase one, phase two, phase three. Then the results of the phase three trial are presented uh, by the FDA and by the sponsor to an advisory committee made up of experts mm -hmm. from the rest of the country who do not work for the FDA. And it's actually the advisory committee that makes a determination as to whether or not to recommend approval. The FDA does not have to follow the advisory committee's recommendation, but it generally does. So the process is, is very comprehensive and very transparent. Okie doke. Um, uh, let's go over now to um, to Dr. Lopez, and we've been talking about you know working on a vaccine to to protect us, and also the trials for uh, for the antibody, and also that's what I wanted to ask you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mila, um, at what stage um, are, is this test right now? Before we go to Dr. Lopez, what, at what stage is the monoclonal study that you guys are conducting? It's a phase two study. Okay, doc. All righty. Okay, Dr. Lopez. You are treating people who have COVID-19, um, and, you know, we're, what, about seven months into this now. What are doctors, what are health care workers uh, now feeling more comfortable with in terms of treatment for someone who is pretty ill with it? Well, first of all, most people are going to have mild infections. About 80 percent of people who develop COVID-19 will be mild. They'll be 
managed as an outpatient, it'll be primarily supportive care. There's really no treatment that's been proven effective in those individuals with mild infection or um, even asymptomatic infection. But people who have severe COVID-19, people who are short of breath, um, their oxygen levels are low, um, perhaps their lungs have more than 50% of their uh, volume involved, um, those are people with severe disease and we do have some treatments that have been proven in a randomized clinical trial fashion to either provide mortality benefit or clinical benefit. If you have severe COVID-19 and you're hospitalized, remdesivir, an antiviral, provides some clinical benefit. The recovery time has decreased in those individuals from about 15 days to 11 days. Now, in terms of mortality, if you have severe COVID-19 and you require oxygen as well, we have steroids now, corticosteroids, particularly dexamethasone, which has been studied. And there, there is a mortality benefit to receiving dexamethasone if you have severe COVID-19 and are requiring oxygen, either uh, in a non-invasive fashion or on a mechanical ventilator. So there, there is a mortality benefit mm -hmm. that's provided. Um, convalescent plasma, this is plasma that's been collected from people who have had COVID-19 and recovered and developed antibodies. Uh, uh, convalescent plasma has emergency use authorization for treatment as well. It's not been studied in a well-controlled trial. We're waiting on those studies, similar to the ones that we have heard about for monoclonal antibody development as well. But it does make some sense that these antibodies could mm -hmm. decrease the duration of symptoms and or the severity of illness. But again, we're waiting on randomized clinical trials to prove it, but it does have emergency use authorization, probably most beneficial when given early in the course of illness. You know, when this first came upon us, um, and this, of course, there were so many patients, particularly here in the New Orleans area, this was a hot spot. Um, and, you know, how to treat them. I, I know you guys use a certain protocol for certain illnesses, but do you feel more comfortable now? Do you feel that you are understanding how to get better outcomes now? I think it's, it, I think we feel better. We feel more comfortable. We've seen many patients. We've been through two surges, if you will, um, one that occurred in late March and April in this area, and then one that we uh, had in late uh, July, early mm -hmm. August. So we've gotten more comfortable, we have more experience, we have some more agents in our therapeutic armamentarium, which have proven to be effective, not as many as we'd like. We still don't have anything that's proven to be preventative, uh, which would also be nice to have in our armamentarium, but we do feel more comfortable, and and uh, right now, we are on the good side of a second surge, if you will, with numbers of patients in the hospital and on ventilators which haven't been seen since right. mid-June in between those two surges that we've experienced locally. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back over to you, Dr. Roberts, because you're a pediatrician and, of course, everybody is concerned about the welfare of our children. In terms of vaccine, will there be a, a specific vaccine for kids? Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that early on in this pandemic, there was a sense that children may not be getting sick or even infected, and that's not the case. Um, children are as susceptible to getting the infection as adults. How they will react to vaccination is not uh, clear. It, oftentimes, children are different, even at different age groups, a baby to a toddler to a, a grade school mm -hmm. child and adolescent, all different in how they respond to other medications and certainly may be different in how they respond to vaccines as well. We will be uh, working as part of this initial vaccine study to look at 12 to 15 year old patients as a first foray into vaccine in the younger age group. So I think it's really imperative for our parents and caretakers out there to understand children are at risk for being ill. We've seen some sick children in our clinics and uh, some admitted to our children's hospital as well. And for mm -hmm. those that are asymptomatic, bouncing around and feeling great, they may be spreading the virus to others that are potentially at greater peril. So we want to make sure we can include the uh, children in vaccine strategies um, as a major part of our country's welfare. Dr. Mila, let me ask you, just how prevalent is uh, is the virus? Or, or actually, 
Uh, what percentage of our population, and I hear differing numbers here, but what percentage of our population has been exposed to it? What percentage is still susceptible to being infected? So based on antibody studies, which tell you about exposure, previous exposure to the virus, uh, an average in our area is about 10 percent. But that changes uh, between different locations, and it also changes with uh, occupation. For example, individuals with a public-facing uh, occupation are more likely to have been exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, on our campus, uh, antibody prevalence rates are double what uh, is the average of the community. It's about 20 percent. We we're measuring antibodies and virus uh, in our students, staff, and, and faculty. So uh, there, there are hotspots where uh, exposure is higher in areas where it's lower. And this has been seen internationally as well. There was a very large study done in Spain, in Madrid, which was a hotspot. Uh, rate of antibody prevalence was 13.7 percent, but on average, over the whole country of Spain, it was 5 percent, because mm -hmm. there were areas that hadn't been touched yet. Um, so you, you said that these studies are based on antibodies, but I've heard of something called a T cell, which has sort of a, a memory of immunization to perhaps coronaviruses, just you know a cold virus or something. Um, is is that something maybe that could bring those rates up of people who have been exposed and infected? So immunity to viruses uh, is is a complicated process that involves not only antibodies but also so-called CD8 T cells. There is such a thing as CD8 T cell memory, uh, and these can be measured. Uh, it's much more complicated than measuring antibodies. It's possible, it has been seen in Sweden, for example, that the rate of CD, CD8 T cell immunity uh, is higher than the rate of antibody exposure. Mm -hmm. However, I would like to make a couple of points of caution. First of all, just because we do have CD8 T cells, it doesn't mean they're protective. It means that we've been exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we still don't, we don't know to what extent those cells will be protective. Mm -hmm. And second, we don't know the duration of an immune response. Natural immunity to coronaviruses is, is short-lived. Uh, there were papers coming out recently in the literature in the last few weeks showing that with other coronaviruses, natural immunity doesn't last more than a few months. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether the same is going to be the case for this particular coronavirus, and hopefully immunity triggered by a vaccine will be more prolonged. But again, we're moving, uh, we're looking at a moving time window. We've seen people that were antibody positive lose their antibodies after three months or so. Okay. So again, you're always, you're always looking at a snapshot of what's actually right. A movie. So really, we're still just in the process of learning, discovering, um, and researching. And and so, Dr. Welch, let me take it over to you. I mean, what what should we be expecting in this the population of our region in these next months? And then also, we're coming into flu season. What do, what's going to happen with that? Well, uh, I, I think we all know uh, right now that what we're going to expect is sort of dependent on how we all behave. Um, it, people in places where people are really following those masking, social distancing, washing their hands, staying home if they're sick, um, those places uh, have reduced uh, case counts of, of COVID-19. And in places that sort of become more relaxed or, or people become tired of, of doing these things, those are the places where we're seeing these resurgences. What I'd like to say about flu season is many of the symptoms that we have for flu are very similar to those that we have for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, many of the people who are most at risk for getting severe flu disease are also those that are most at risk for getting COVID-19. So the best protection we have and the best protection we will have for COVID-19 is a vaccine. Well, we have that for influenza right now. So I am recommending uh, that, that people go get that flu vaccine and go get it as soon as it's available. That way you'll be protected against the flu, we, we have no idea what it would be like for one person who got both the flu and coronavirus in the same year. That, that may put you at much higher risk for severe complications. We simply do not know. So the best protection we have against the flu is, is getting that flu shot. Go get that now. And then secondly, those things that protect us against COVID-19, wearing a mask, washing your hands, staying 
distancing and staying six feet away from people are also going to protect you against uh, the flu as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lopez, are, are we uh, anticipating another surge, do you think, as we get into the fall and winter months as much as we do have winter here? I think there's great concern because of the fact that um, winter months bode going indoors and as people go indoors they're closer to one another and there's mm -hmm. an increased risk for transmission of viral infections of all types, influenza, COVID-19. So yes, there's great concern and the fact that we're still at a baseline number of cases in this country that is around 40,000 cases, that's an extremely high baseline. Mm -hmm. So there is great concern that as we go into the fall and winter months that we will see increased numbers of COVID-19. And hopefully we can take the flu out of the equation, just as Dr. Welsh mentioned, mm -hmm. by really encouraging uh, flu vaccination rates that are higher than they have been historically. Okay, I wanna go around to all of you all now because this conversation has moved quickly and we are gonna to have to wrap up. Just really quickly, if you can give me your, your feelings on uh, when do you think we will have a vaccine, except basically like this time next year, where do you think we'll be? Dr. Roberts, start with you. Well, it's hard to predict. I don't think we can wait for definitive results about protections for as long as one or two years from a vaccine. I think we're going to need to take those that seem promising in the uh, initial phases of these phase three studies and based on their availability, begin to move them out. I think we will have safety data earlier than the proven efficacy of our long term. Okay. So I'm hopeful that by spring, um, uh, we will have populations, including those we discussed before okay. that are greatest risk, healthcare workers and those with the uh, potential for greatest complications okay. um, being vaccinated um, in uh, large numbers that will increase through 2021. Okay, dope. Quick thoughts, Dr. Mila, real quick. Uh, I, I would completely agree. Uh, hopefully by next spring, we're going to have the, the populations that are most at risk vaccinated with something that is safe and possibly effective. And we're going to start moving on from there. Meanwhile, okay. however, our best defenses remain the same. Wearing masks, getting that flu vaccine, as Dr. Welch said, absolutely, and maintaining social distancing. Okay. In right. fact, there's some evidence that wearing masks may actually promote, uh, it, it would work sort of a, a homemade vaccine. There's a, a, at least one suggestion in the New England Journal of Medicine that people who are infected while wearing masks receive a lower dose of virus mm. and develop asymptomatic disease with immunity as opposed to symptomatic disease. Okay. We don't actually have solid data on that, but anecdotally, we, we have seen cases okay. like that. All righty, real quick, Dr. Welch, real quick. Your thoughts? Mid-spring mid -spring to early summer. Okay. Wear your mask. <laughs> Dr. Lopez, quick last word. Agree, agree with um, the other discussants. Okay. I just would make sure that we do a better job of messaging uh, regarding COVID-19 vaccination than we have done for the flu historically. Okay. All right, guys, thank you so much, all of the doctors there. Thank you for the great conversation and very important information. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to join us for our next installment coming up in November, taking a look at how this has all impacted our hospitality industry. Thanks for watching.